truth that we're struggling with today in this matter of impatience, this matter of contentment. Jesus said he was coming back. Well, where is he? The world would cause us to wonder. When is he coming? People want a date. People want a time frame. Let's pick it up in verse 9. Be afflicted. Let's not be double-minded. Let's be afflicted and mourn and weep. There are challenges. There's going to be struggles in the Christian life. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. There's a time to laugh and there's a time to mourn. Your joy and your joy to heaviness. Verse 10 again reminding us, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He shall lift you up. The best way to win an argument is just to admit that you're sorry, please forgive me, and let it go. We don't need to defend ourselves or to fight for our cause, especially if it's just an opinion, especially if it's just a preference. That's a whole lot different, of course, than a major doctrine that Jesus is God and that He is the coming Son of God coming back to set up His kingdom and save people, then get to go home to heaven. We don't give up on the doctrines, but we ought to be willing to be generous and humble concerning our preferences uh, and our opinions that may not be backed up scripturally. Speak not evil one of another. That's called criticism. We all struggle with that. It's a way of building ourselves up if we can tear somebody else down. We don't want to get caught in that as a church. We're thankful today that you're here not being critical, but you're here to speak not evil one of another, verse number 11 says, Brethren, again, talking to saved people, he that speaketh evil of his brother and judgeth his brother speaketh evil of the law and judgeth the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. We have one lawgiver, of course, that's God the Father, Jesus the Son, who is able, verse 12, this, there's one lawgiver who is able to save and to destroy. Who art thou that judgest another? Let's be careful that we don't get involved in a church full of gossip, a church full of criticism. If you hear some story that seems a little too hard to believe, go to that individual and say, I heard something about you and I didn't think it was true. Would you confirm or verify the truth of this statement? And may God help us to solve the problem. If you're not strong enough to do that as a baby Christian or a carnal Christian, ask somebody to go with you. Or if somebody brings a story to you that may not be true, it could be critical, could be a, a judging statement about somebody else, say, well, let's go talk to that person together right now. Please, that'll be the best way to resolve an issue, a conflict that could develop as a little seed of judgmental, critical uh, spirit, a haughty spirit thinking we're better than somebody else. Uh, let's deal with that quickly so that we can maintain unity in the house of the Lord. And let's not go to verse 13 where it says, Go to now, ye that say today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Now, in getting gain, but there is a sin in doing something without praying about God's perfect will. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. The guy that says, I'm going to move, I'm going to get a, a better position. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. We have no guarantee of tomorrow, ladies and gentlemen. Be patient. Our theme today, start right so that you can end right, is the subject that we're moving towards now. How's your patience ability today? How's your contentment here in good old New England? It's our prayer that many will come from the South and the West and come back and help evangelize New England so that those who left maybe out of God's will could come back and reclaim God's will and find contentment in a place that may cost a little more to live in the inner city. It may be a little less comfortable not having a big green yard and several acres uh, of land to celebrate life in, but be patient. Our time here is very brief. We usually apply this scripture to lost people to try to scare them into heaven. You say, can you scare somebody into heaven? Absolutely. Jesus taught more about hell than he did heaven. So if we can scare people that they're going to die and go to hell, that's the, one of the motivations to get people saved. If that doesn't work, then you talk about heaven and the beauty of living in a place without sin forever. Wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't that be joy that we wouldn't have to struggle with the old nature, that old sinful nature that wants to lust and covet and be discontent and impatient with what we were given? In America, we've been given more than most people in the world. May we find satisfaction and joy in this Thanksgiving season. 
That's where we're headed today. Thanksgiving for the glory of God. Contentment in patience in the will of God. In patience. Remember, that's spelled I-N. In patience with the will of God. Let's pick it up there as we finish verse 14. For what is your life? It's even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. My pastor that led me to Christ had a radio program and he would always end it with this phrase, we'll see you in the morning, the Lord willing. And that's what we should say. I'll see you next Sunday, the Lord willing. I'll see you tonight, the Lord willing. And if you're willing, I'll be getting, again sharing more details tonight. I am a pastor that wants to be totally accountable. We don't want you to think we've just been out laying in the sun for seven weeks out in Arizona. We want to tell you that we love the Lord enough that even if we could have done that and deserved to do that after 41 years in one place, we didn't go there to have a vacation. We went there to have a different variety of ministry and a little different scenery, and we really, God blessed us with a lot of unique experiences. Beautiful, beautiful Arizona, but nothing like Massachusetts. We couldn't have looked at an ocean if we wanted to. We'd have had to take six or eight hours of driving just to see an ocean. We were reacquainted with some old friends that were members of this church. Not that they're old, but it's been a while since they've been here. Kevin and Danila Lynn say hello, as well as their four children now living in, in California. He's serving in the military and wished us to wish you a happy uh, Thanksgiving and say hello for us to, from them. We had a real nice reunion with them. And they helped increase our attendance on the last Sunday we were there. Our attendance jumped up, I believe, to 20 Sunday morning, counting six of them, four children and two. And we, like I say, had a wonderful time of fellowship with them. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. Thank God for the military. They risk their lives. Thank God for the police force. They risk their lives to protect us from wicked, evil people. But let's remember, our biggest enemy is within ourselves. It's that conflict between the two natures that we have as saved people. The nature to want to struggle with, uh, with criticism, with judgment, and not holding the biblical position for ourselves. Verse 16, but now you rejoice in your... All such rejoicing is evil. In other words, a bragging. We like to brag on what we did. Well, if we did anything of value, it was because Christ did it in and through us that we want to give the Holy Spirit some recognition that He saved us, He's convicted us of our sins, and now He wants us to live in unity and blessing. And to, again, this pastor wants to thank his two faithful deacons who stepped up to the plate, along with many of you lay people, and helped to maintain unity and direction and purpose for this church, even in our absence. So again, thank you, deacons. Thank you, Sunday school teachers, junior church workers, bus workers, everybody that worked in the nursery. You had a part here. You served a meal to the seniors and veterans. And guess what? We even got to enjoy some of that upon our return. So what a blessing to see a working church even when the pastor was away and he was rejoicing in your good works because you did it in the name of Christ. Verse 17 is the warning now before we go to the real subject. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is what? Say it. Sin. If you're not involved in the ministry of this church, my question is why not? We have many opportunities, many openings. You need to have a ministry or you'll get bored with no, doing nothing. You were saved to serve. You're saved to be baptized by immersion in water. You are saved to be a member then, an active member that's accountable to a pastor and deacons and a church family that loves you enough to help you to maintain unity instead of disunity. The world favors disunity. The world favors this competition spirit. In the biblical church, there's no competition. In a biblical church, we surrender our will to each other that we can serve each other so that there can be unity and we can have the strength of courage and character to step outside these protected walls to face an ungodly world that in some cases aren't really open to the gospel. And they will object to your sharing the gospel in some cases or object to your sharing the truth, as we heard about the little things in Sunday school. How to start right. You start right by getting saved. You start right by having a thankful attitude daily. Paul said to the Thessalonians, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 
You say, well, it's easy to give thanks for a delicious turkey dinner and all the trimmings. Yeah, uh, how easy it is when you see one of your children sick. One of the members of the Lighthouse Baptist Church in Camp Verde, Arizona, a six-year-old little Austin Stream. He was born, and within his first year of life, he was diagnosed with cancer in his eye, his left eye. It was removed just a week before we arrived there because the cancer threat was that it would spread to the other eye, and so one eye had to be removed. We were delighted to have that little fellow in our service with his patch on his left eye and have him lead in prayer, and he, it was his tradition and custom that he would pass the offering plate to the 12 to 14 people that normally attend there on Sunday morning, and we were delighted to hear that little fellow's prayer with his parents sitting there as happy and as proud as they could be, not angry with God because of the sickness that has been born into his body by genetics uh, that other family members have struggled with, but here's a family today that's been to the hospital in and out and continue to go very regularly because of the threat of that cancer spreading not only to the right eye but more seriously to the brain and causing uh, severe uh, complications for that little life. He's been used of God even to help raise money for other people in these categories. He's been known to give a speech on uh, uh, live stream where he's uh, raised uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars to help other uh, children that have this same kind of a genetic problem to deal with. My point is, be content. If you have sick children, if you're sick yourself, let's be patient, let's be content, because God wants to use our patience and our contentment uh, that we can give thanks. Let's pick it up there in chapter 5, verse 7. Be patient, therefore. Why? Because of all these struggles going on, we see the conflict in the world. We see conflict in families. We see churches splitting and dividing. And we see Satan on the rampage. But James says here to these Christians, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. That's the motivating factor. Brother Rosada did a great job of convincing us that the rapture of the church is imminent. It could happen today. And we need to be ready. Be patient. We may not have forever to get this thing together and do the will of the Lord. He's due back any minute. We believe he'll be back before the great tribulation begins, not after. He'll be back before to take us home to heaven. Be patient, therefore. Look at the verse, uh, the next sentence. Behold, the husband. This is a, uh, another word for the farmer. The farmer waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth. Takes time to grow food. And notice it's referred to as being precious. Uh, don't we all love food unless we're sick? We all enjoy eating. And I hope you've had a happy Thanksgiving and looking forward to a happy Christmas meal with your family. The illustration here James is using is be careful. You may be impatient, but take the farmer. He waits for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience, long patience for it, until he received the early and latter rain. The Middle East, uh, rainfalls come in the fall. They plant seeds in the fall. They get a lot of rain in the fall, and then again early in the spring, and the crop matures. But it takes patience to see the crop wait for the latter rain. And he's saying to us in verse 8, Be also patient. Be also patient. Establish your hearts. Establish your, your faith. For the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. It could be today. It's coming soon. Are you ready? for the coming of the Lord. That's the motivation to live a holy, separated, godly life. Don't fall in love with the world. If you're in love with the world, you're an enemy of God. We read that earlier. It couldn't be written any stronger. May God help us to see the little sin of discontentment, the little sin of impatience in this matter of living the Christian life. Be patient. Why? Because of the coming of the Lord. It's getting close. Verse 9, grudge not. Don't be filled with stress, anxiety, and conflict. Grudge not one against another. Don't let a conflict between another brother or sister, whether they're saved or lost, don't let a conflict like that hurt your relationship with God. Here's the warning, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. And, of course, that's God, the judge, Christ, Jesus, the judge. How to start right? Be saved and know it. Remember here, we're going to think specifically about some of the prophets. Take my brethren, verse 10. Talking to saved people, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. 
I dare say any of us have a six-year-old here in the condition of the boy I just mentioned and the parents that love the Lord today and are giving God the glory for giving them the grace to go through the difficulties they've gone through, the thousands of dollars of medical expenses that God's people have helped to reach and the world has come to their rescue. How to start right? Build your life on Christ. Build your life on the testimony of these prophets. Remember Daniel, who was uh, cast into the lion's den. Remember Jeremiah and the fact he was lowered down into a, uh, an empty well, into a sludge and mud, and, and uh, was given breadcrumbs to eat uh, uh, and barely survived that. But he lives today as an example of suffering affliction for the glory of God because he suffered with patience. And he sets an example for us.